Konami's The Legend of the Mystical Ninja for the Super NES, released in 1992. And here's a fast fact. This is the first ever American localization of Ganbare Goemon, which started off in the mid-80s. First in the arcades and later on the Famicom. For those not familiar with the Mystical Ninja and or Ganbar and Goemon series, it started off, as you heard earlier, in the mid to late 80s, based on a fictional Japanese folklore thief, Goemon Ishikawa, with Mr. Goemon, an arcade game where you fend off enemies and collect gold. His legacy later exploded throughout the coming years on the Famicom and on various other consoles, consisting of not only the trademark platformers, but also a plethora of genres like RPGs, puzzle and board games. Hell, he was even a selectable character in the second Parodius game, Goku Joe Parodius, which I'll save for a later review, and even various media adaptations in the form of manga, and even two OVAs released in both halves of the 90s, 91 and 98 respectively, in the short-lived late 90s anime series. But the outing we're dealing with is, yet again, the first of the five games within the franchise to be released outside Japan. And for the love of Mike, don't even get me started with the goddamn N64 installments. History set in stone, if not fully, the game opens up with his dopey companion, Abisumaru, aka Dr. Yang, a regular of the series no less, informing Goemon, aka Kid Ying, of a supernatural being roaming within their local Edo temple, namely the Horo Temple, hence their intent on investigating said paranormal occurrence. And in all seriousness, not to trek too far into spoiler territory, but eventually the pair is plummeted within the most thought and instinct provoking journey of their natural born lives involving even more paranormal bullshit, a secret magical ninja feline clan, Speedy, Polly, and Guido meet your new roommates. And what's even more intriguing, the rescue of a kidnapped princess of their beloved nation from an infamous perpetrating counterfeiter slash assassin syndicate. The basic gameplay and controls are as follows. Being much more than just your average as fuck, quirky, action-adventure platformer hybrid, aka what I like to call the bastard love child of River City Ransom by Technos Japan and Data East and Irem's Kid Nikki, it's set throughout various parts of Edo, or feudal Japan if you will, no damn less. Assuming the control of either Goemon and or Bisumaru, again renamed here as Kid Ying and or Dr. Yang, respectively, the entire layout is a two-tier stage setup, or warlock zones as they're referred to, the first of which involves either one of the two, if both, traveling around a certain village, wiping out random strangers and creatures, including salesmen, wannabe samurais, fishermen, crazed taxpayers, etc. The obvious exceptions being the ladies and the deer. Don't even fucking think about it. The former of which grants you compensational benefits upon getting better acquainted with them, or just getting near them, obviously. And for the latter, you're better off avoiding them. Not to mention gathering cash and Maneki Neko, or lucky cat statues, and even scrolls for weapon upgrades and such. Visiting homes, stores, establishments, and conversing with random townspeople, purchasing necessary items, and the like. The second, upon approaching your guardian Tanuki and or raccoon dog, a more intense platformer style scene ensues, in which you're taking on even tougher supernatural enemies than before followed by a duel to the death with a mysterious adversary, after which you're provided more clues to the knowledge of the princess's location of her capture. Now be forewarned, each two-tier warlock zone is timed, so if I were you, I wouldn't get too fucking comfortable. Your basic controls are as follows. Your D-pad moves around your character in both warlock zone areas, entering places whenever possible, even plank crawl in the second warlock zone area by using diagonal down left or down right. Start pauses and resumes, like most games obviously, or skips cutscenes. The select button checks your character's inventory. As for the shoulder buttons, while L isn't used for deadly squats, R is used to swap your weapon types. In Kid Ying's case, he's got a pipe, types A and or B, the latter of which works if it's upgraded, and a deadly yo-yo later, with coins being a secondary weapon. And in Dr. Yang's case, he's got a flute, types A and or B, same spiel, and a distracting party favor later, and he's got shurikens for a secondary weapon, and both of them can use bombs for later, that is, if they purchase them. A and Y are used for attacking in conjunction with all directions, depending on which warlock zone area you're playing in. B is used for jumping, X calls forth and or deactivates a jutsu strike, which can be acquired in later parts of the game, to be mentioned momentarily, or makes your character exit an establishment. As for Kitty and Dr. Yang's weapon lineup, they both start off with a pipe and flute respectively, as mentioned before. Upon scoring a cat statue, following 8 random enemy kills, the rightful trademark weapon's length and attack are leveled up, and the same effect is doubled after scoring another. Take damage at any point, however, and those correction rods of theirs are reversed to total jack shit. 
and you can even purchase bombs from various stores to further round out your arsenal. But be forewarned, like the aforementioned projectile weapons, they can go to waste very goddamn quickly. Bottom line, I strongly suggest using them accordingly, especially during boss battles. In terms of defense accessories, they're even equipped with straw hats, coats, sandals, and later, real samurai armor made of numerous types of metal, including gold, iron, chain, what have you, that can be purchased from various stores. And take note, upon wearing any of these, your character is invulnerable for a few hits. With the obvious exception of pre-purchased rations, for example a pizza slice, hamburger, what have you, which heal you automatically upon death, you can actually refill your life upon visiting assorted restaurants within the area, and even racking up on hearts. Even visiting inns and saunas are also a plus, and the prices depend on the quality of what you're expecting in terms of various accommodations or food, what have you, like in the real world, obviously. Your life is also extended upon obtaining a golden cat statue and are allowed an instant checkpoint and or continue opportunity upon scoring an elephant or visiting the aforementioned Tanuki statue. There's even a diverse array of mini games to participate in, depending on which stage you're in, to prevent the game from getting too stale. Those include, but maybe not limited to, homages to Breakout or Taito's Arkanoid if you will, and even a showcase demo of the first stage in Gradius, another Konami classic. Betting opportunities in the form of horse race tracks, dice games, lottery, mazes like the actual gameplay, memory concentration, whack-a-mole, goblin, throw a ball within the bucket whenever the arrow points proportionately to it, fortune telling, painting, and the like. Onto the Jutsu abilities, and fuck no this has jack shit to do with Naruto whatsoever. They're applied to your repertory of offenses upon visiting a local dojo for a certain price, and can only be used in the second part of your current warlock zone, depending on how much scrolls you've collected within the first part. Those include your character riding a tiger feasible for jumping on enemies, Dio's holy diver anyone, levitation or flying at will, firing off sparks in five different directions, a half circle pattern no less, and even summoning a deranged kabuki actor whose only means of offense is applied via his hair. Scott O'Connor much? Although those abilities have their myriad of merits, personally I could never find the best possible opportunity for any of them. Control-wise, they're spot-on and receptive as always despite how moderately stagnant they can become and are virtually identical no matter which character you take control of, style-wise. And the overall gameplay routine is nothing short of uplifting and provocative, regardless of which situation you're involved within. In terms of challenge, like most Konami games I've reviewed thus far, if not every single one, hopefully at this juncture I'm not sounding too much like a broken record, The Legend of the Mystical Ninja starts off as a typical leisurely walk in the park, being provided with what you're up against, what have you, if beyond what one could possibly expect. But my gentle Jesus, upon reaching at least the second part of stage 2, or maybe a bit further, this game will scramble much more than just your intellect like a goddamn egg white. For instance, there are some unpredictable as hell enemies, like those raving lunatic coin thrower dipshits in Stage 2, the slot machine button platforms in Stage 4, aka the Otafu Army HQ, that reveal random surprises in the form of power-ups, hazards, enemies, etc., and even the rotating poles with spikes to keep a close eye out for in that very same stage, amongst various risks that await you within every next to last stage. If either Goemon or Abyssumaru get their asses handed to them in a paper shredder, it's an instant life loss, in this case you only start off with two, but you can rack up another life later in the game. Upon losing your last life, however, it's an instant fucking game over. Beyond said point, aside from starting a certain stage over, there's that aforementioned continuation opportunity which I suggest referring back to when I discuss the supporting power-ups. Not only that, there's even a password system, composed of upper and lowercase letters, random characters, punctuation marks, shapes, etc., which you can access upon your decision to end your journey and or visiting a diary recording facility within a later warlock zone area. And must I mention that they must be written down or copied, considering its simplistic yet mind-blowing length, and or looked up on your favorite site online for future reference? The graphics are countless light years upon light years beyond sensational, even for a 16-bit Konami game from 92. It's not just the main characters themselves, and in later cases the supporting ones, and or the enemies that they face, with a range of personas, from semi-chibi-fied to zany and not to mention massive, regal, and not to be fucked with. Most of the stage exteriors and interiors, not to mention the cutscenes, are very reminiscent of the old Land of the Rising Sun, not to mention various Kurosawa, God rest his soul, and various horror and anime motifs. You can tell right away that Konami pulled way more strings than one could possibly count, as they always do, in recreating the ancient feudal themes, especially with their often exceptional fail-safe attention to detail, not to mention their innovative beyond belief transparent layers, and Mode 7 animation tactics of its age no less. 
As for the music and sound, composed by the combined efforts of Kazuhiko Uehara and Harumi Ueko of Turtles in Time and Tournament Fighters fame, the game's overall soundtrack is, without any reservation whatsoever, alive and kicking, no pun intended, along with its preceding graphical capabilities. And once again, it far exceeds the expectation of any otaku or Japan enthusiast, like yours truly, and Lindquist from Fancy Lad, that is if he's watching this, recreating the game's main oriental rising sun motif. My top 5 personal favorites are as follows. The Awaji Island Amusement Park in Stage 3 Section B, the Shikoku Island Dance Festival Before the Boss in Stage 2 Section B, the Otafu Army HQ in Stage 4 Section B, and even the boss theme for all stages. And finally, for Mystical Ninja's replayability, aside from the simultaneous two-player co-op like the Final Fight series by Capcom, Sega Streets of Rage trilogy, YY World 1 and 2, the Contra and Ninja Turtles games, and other Konami greats, and even the aforementioned multi-variety mini-games featured within, the union of dramatic moments and eccentric gags, and even the manic, mind-bending strategies and gameplay will keep your ass coming back for more unlike no other. Trust me, it makes Spyro the Dragon look like Lester the Unlikely. In summation, my final verdict on The Legend of the Mystical Ninja, while there are better platformers and or icons out there that once stood out, or hell, still stand out even today, during its age, it's easy to see why games like this one don't get as much time in the limelight like the others. Think of the Vector Man series by Sega and Blue Sky, Sega's Comic Zone, Sega and Treasure's Gunstar Heroes, Irem's Dino City, Jaleco's Totally Rad, Shatterhand by Jaleco and Natsume, Sega and Treasure's Dynamite Heady, Wild Guns by Natsume, and others. However, despite whatever flaws I might have pointed out, which I'm in no goddamn position to recapitulate, in my book, it's definitely exceptional and a total series of thrills an hour to have on your Super NES. Hell, it's also available via the Virtual Console and the Wii U for all the next-gen addicts out there. By all means, hunt it down like a rabid deer. I assure you there'll be no sign of disappointment doing so. Oh crap no, rhyme not intended. Until then, Bonsai Retro Gamers, this is the Hardcore Retro God signing off. And if he's watching this, a humble happy birthday to Mike Maverick, the AIDS gamer from Turnabout Entertainment, entertaining for great justice. Also, we should definitely do a collab review sometime, for sure. <laughs>